Good morning. Hello. It is Tuesday, March 24th. This is my second week of quarantine. I may have mentioned that yesterday, but you know what I didn't mention? A whole bunch of other stuff I wanted to talk about. So first of all, I remembered the name of the book that uh, I referenced last time by C.S. Lewis. It's called Allegory of Love. Sorry, I should maybe not play with my lens gap while I'm talking. That might be a distracting sound. I'm not good at this. I don't know how other people vlog. It is very awkward and already I'm forgetting. Oh, right. Allegory of Love. Also, Joseph Campbell. So, I don't know if anybody else has this experience, but I have... I really, really enjoy mythology, folklore, medieval literature. So all of these things that Joseph Campbell is very well known for and has written a lot about and given a lot of lectures about. But I have like, like there's part of me that really struggles with his style. And I think it comes down to the fact that he's like this really strong like unionist. And so he's like, all, like it always feels like a bit of a shove to put everything underneath this like one banner. So like with a, you know, hero with a thousand faces, it's like shove, 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 all like major myths and mythologies and adventure stories like fall in line with this one particular like narrative arc, which like it's a well-known book and it's a strong argument because it's so true. Um, but like my interest is like, oh, look at all of these things that are the that are very, very similar, but they diverge. So why do they diverge? And so I've always been interested in that. And so I'll give you an example. I really enjoy learning languages. So obviously I have the Latin and the ancient Greek from doing my classical studies. I've also studied French, Russian, Korean, Spanish, and a little bit of Gaelic. And so out of curiosity, because I've studied all of these languages, I decided like, oh, I should learn like a computer programming language to see how we develop sort of the logical framework and construction of a system of meaning making that's designed to be for a computer as opposed to a human being, which means that there's going to be no symbolic level, there's going to be no metaphorical level, and it's going to be like completely consistent and logical across the board because a computer cannot interpret, a computer can only like translate, if you will. But I found it like extremely boring, and I realized the reason why I found that boring is because it's actually the like unusual bits of the language and the unusual pieces where it kind of set, makes me kind of like perk up and go like, oh, well, but why is that there? And so I think that's like sort of a fundamental difference between what I'm curious about versus what like someone like Joseph Campbell might have been curious about. This is me completely like over interpreting everything. And so it was, it's always like a little bit frustrating for me to read his writing. So on in this book that I read, and I'm gonna have to look up the title later because I do not remember. A grail, grail might be in, in the title. Seems seems a reasonable guess, but uh, he's sort of like making this argument. Oops, that's my ring on the desk. Um, he's sort of like making this argument that the Arthur narratives are a secularization of the Christian narrative. That it is this new sort of Christianized culture that is trying to find a way of having purpose and meaning while also being a Christian, which seems like such an unusual place to be from a modern perspective. And so the argument that he makes is like, because salvation is just like completely handled by the death and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that these sort of like warrior people groups are now finding like that there's nothing quote unquote left for them to do. So they have to like make up these sort of like hybrid, sexu secular hybridized, and but also religious quests, you know, the quest for the Holy Grail, to then give purpose to their physical and temporal lives. Because like the purpose in their spiritual life has been like kind of taken away or like completely fulfilled by the death of Christ. I just, I don't like it. And I know that I don't like it because I'm a Christian so I'm biased, and so I think there's, my, my personal faith definitely comes in conflict with this view, so I'm just going to throw it out here. This is my biased, subjective, personal opinion, and I just feel like, so there's this really famous quote by G.K. Chesterton, I think, I think it's a Chesterton quote that goes that the Christian faith 
has not been tried and found wanting. It has been tried and found difficult, or it has been left untried and found difficult. And I think that really gets at the, my own personal feeling about my journey with my faith is that there isn't a lack of adventure or quest in my pursuit of trying to be like Christ because it's a, a profoundly difficult thing to do. I think it runs contrary to human nature in a lot of ways. I think anybody who's sort of like looked at the teachings of Christ and been like, okay, well, how do I practically implement this in my life? Or how do I like sincerely try, try to follow the wisdom that Christ taught, even if you, you know, kind of want to just look at that, that alone is like this profound challenge. And maybe it's because of the way in which the medieval church separated out the lay person from, you know, the maybe the nun in the nunnery or the monk in the monastery or, you know, the actual like priest or serving sort of clergyman. Or maybe because that dichotomy was so strong within the social fabric that that becomes a more relevant kind of conversation. So I could see that being true because of course with like the Protestant faith, which I should say I'm Protestant, I'm not Catholic, you know, you have the sense of like the priesthood of the believer and so there is this sense of like your spiritual life is your own to sort of like put forth and pursue alongside being a part of the church body. So anyway, those are just some of my thoughts. But okay, back to Chrétien de Troyes and where I am and actually reading right now. So one of the things that I totally forgot to talk about, which I totally meant to talk about yesterday, part of the reason I'm so bad at this is, it's okay, we'll get better. I need to be nice to myself. Is um, So Eric and Anid is the first story that's in here. I'm re reading it in order, the way you do. And then the second one I mentioned is Cliché. And Cliché obviously deals a lot more with that similar archetype of this sort of like forbidden love because like the structural imposition of the marriage is in the way of true love, right? And this sort of like social hierarchy of power is in the way of true love. And so as opposed to with Eric and Enid, what we see the conflict sur surrounding is not so much about like this sort of like structural institutional marriage, but rather the claims of like knighthood coming in conflict with Eric's love for Enid. And so like he really just wants to like stay at home and be with this woman whom he's married to and is absolutely in love with and she's absolutely in love with him. But it's like he needs to go out and be a chivalrous and courageous knight and have, like have, fight these battles and, and all of these things. And so they go on adventures together but that like obviously is it puts a strain on their relationship. So it's like how how does he you know balance the two? It's like work-life balance, you know? We're dealing with that today. Whereas with cliche, because it's dealing with this traditional romance theme, it's like, it's so interesting to see how much more it sort of like philosophizes on the nature of love. Um, there's quite a few pa passages in here where it's talking about like how the characters feel about being in love and what, you know, metaphorical love or Cupid kind of does to them. And I'm like reflecting on the way that this idea is inherited from, you know, obviously classical Greece and Rome. And it is in fact like using a Cupid, like literally Cupid as, as, as the sort of personification of this force. And so with the Greco-Roman conception, like the, the idea of love is like this horrible chaotic force, like this really, really bad thing that can happen to you. The classic example is like Dido and Aeneas in the Aeneid, where um, Dido like absolutely falls in love with Aeneas. And it, the metaphorical language is like, oh, she's been pierced with the arrow of love, but it's like extremely painful. It sends her into madness. When Aeneas decides he's gonna sail away and actually like found Rome, she like throws herself on a funeral pyre. So it's like this destructive force that's like absolutely not viewed in a positive light. It's viewed in this really destructive and violent and like, it's like a madness. It's like a disease of madness. By the time we're getting to like what Chrétien de Troyes is describing, it's much more like, yeah, love is like this sweet pain, this like delightful pain and delightful suffering. So the people who are, you know, pierced with the barbs of love, yes, it's painful, but they don't want a remedy from it. They will, the only remedy is of course their beloved, but they want to like sort of sigh and think about their love and sit at home and, you know, just kind of like wallow in their misery. And it's so much more closer to our own conception of like 
gosh, and I even remember feeling this way when I had, like, crushes when I was younger, you know, and just like this sighing love, you know, and it's so, so interesting to see how that conception is still here. And then, of course, I'm, like, thinking about Shakespeare, so, like, Hamlet, for example, and his, like, the way that he sort of pretends to be madly in love and, like, uses that as a cover for his madness, um, though there may be method in it. Um, even that in, like, Shakespeare, this sort of, like, distraught lover, you can see sort of the seeds of that in these types of narratives. So anyway, those are some of the things that I forgot to talk about yesterday. I didn't make a huge amount of progress um, reading, but also it's, like, first thing in the morning, and I had to get up and tell you all the things I was thinking about. So we'll see how much further I get today. This, I'm, like I said, I'm in the middle of this Lancelot tale. Yeah, this one's really interesting. It's like, the other thing that I'm seeing like come through is this sense of like, how f much a knight is willing to give up his sense of like respect and position in like the social hierarchy in order to it achieve his love. So like Lancelot is totally willing to go through all of these shameful things to like satisfy his longing and his desire. So anyway, those are some thoughts. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow.